Hello and welcome to the fourth lecture on applications of big data, machine learning and artificial intelligence in scanning probe and electron microscopy. In this lecture, we are going to talk about the applications of supervised and unsupervised learning in scanning probe microscopy imaging. So this lecture is based on the work done by myself and uh, Stephen Jesse at the Center for Nanophase Material Science in Oak Ridge National Laboratory, in collaboration with a large number of our colleagues, postdoctoral scientists and students, who will be duly mentioned at each uh, specific. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss why do we need to analyze images and scanning probe and electron microscopy in the first place? So what can we hope to learn out of the precise image analytics? We are going to briefly discuss the methods based on the global Fourier transform and introduce the methods based on the Fourier transform in the sliding window, so-called sliding FFT. And we'll talk about how apply it for filtering how to use the combination of sliding FFT and linear and mixing methods, and consider several examples, for example, graphene or iridium telluride. After this sliding Fourier methods, we are going to briefly introduce the methods based on the atom finding, including those that utilize Fourier filtering, and the general approach of the local crystallography illustrated for the uh, surface of the manganite image by STM. After that, I'm going to briefly discuss the property mining from correlative imaging. In other words, how can we combine the information from structural image and functional image to get some insight into the structure property relationship in the material. This lecture is going to be based on largely historic material going back about 10 years. So stay tuned for the future opportunities in STEM and SPM which will, where we will talk about the deep learning for atomic finding, defect libraries, extraction of reaction pathways, structural descriptors, and learning physics from the microscopy data. However, the topics that discussed in this lecture provide the background on which these more advanced applications are built. Let's start from the very beginning. What can we learn from the images? So what you see here is the example of the scanning tunneling microscopy image of the high temperature superconductor. You can clearly see that most of the image is ideal surface. And then we clearly see the number of atomic defects. So the question becomes, what can we learn from this image? And the answer is quite a lot. For example, we can visualize the defects. We can see where uh, they are localized to some extent, how they interact and how the properties of the material are affected by the defects. Secondly, and perhaps even more excitingly, there is a lot of information which is contained in the atomic positions. For example, once we see all the atoms in the image, we can determine the atomic bond lengths and knowing bond lengths and bond angles opens the window towards exploration of the physics of the material. So how can we extract this information out of the image? Well, uh, the first thing is that we need to come with a plan of action. So what is the general workflow for the image analytics? Why do we need image analysis? And it turns out that we can subdivide this process into the four individual stages. So the stage one is if we have the image for example, electron scanning probe microscopy image, the question becomes, can we get the material specific information out of the microscopy data? For example, if we want to do the quantitative analysis, we don't need the image per se. We want to extract the material specific information. For example, for scanning transmission electron microscopy, we want to extract atomic coordinates. For Ronke graphic imaging or 4D stem, we want to extract the scattering potential. For scanning probe microscopy, for example, STM, we want to extract the density of states and the Fermi level and then reduce it to the atomic coordinates. So this is the question of 
how can we get material specific information from microscopy data and of course the important uh, issue is that at which level of confidence how do much do we trust the sensors how is this knowledge affected and how can it be improved from the knowledge of the imaging system and uh, how can it be improved by the knowledge of the material and i will show you a few examples when we do exactly that our second stage is uh, can we use the material specific information so information on the material which is no longer dependent on the microscope with the no uncertainties to infer the physics and chemistry of the material and we can do it either through the correlative models so this is a classical machine learning or through the recovery of the generative physics for example if we see where all the atoms in the image are question becomes can we find the parameters that determine the interaction between those atoms or if we see the movie of the atoms moving in the electron microscope can we somehow extract the force fields acting between these atoms the third step is of course uh, can we use this uh, information either correlative or causative to reconstruct materials behaviors for example phase diagrams and so on and so forth so it turns out that of these first three questions the first one is something that is extensively studied in the context of the microscopy this is what microscopists do the third one is uh, something that theory community is very uh, much focused on what is largely missing is this second step so can we take our microscopy data and convert it to the material specific information can we build the correlative models of the material can we understand the physics of the material and this is largely the topic that i'm going to talk about in this and the several subsequent lectures now the important thing is that uh, this type of problems are obviously have been solved by scientific community for quite a while and one example of the field where this type of analytic is well developed is astronomy so astronomers don't get to do experiments they do a lot of observations and they can infer a lot of information about the universe from observations only so the question is can we do the same thing for physics of materials so this is where the machine learning and image analytics comes uh, extremely handy and uh, allows us to analyze all the data in the image analyze the data in the comparable and ideally unbiased fashion and also analyze the data in real time and this is the part which is very important because if we can analyze the data in real time and get material specific information then we can harness our microscopes not only to observe but also to modify the materials and in some words make stuff rather than just look at stuff and again i'm going to talk about this in one of the subsequent lectures now let's start from the basics so let's assume that we've just sat in front of our microscope and get a beautiful image and in this case what you can see on the screen is the image of the graphene imaged by the scanning tunneling microscope and all of a sudden you see this huge panoply of different structures of defects some strange changes in the pattern so if you look at the image here and here you can see that image looks very differently the question becomes what can we learn from this image and how can we even start analyzing it and almost always the first step for this analysis is take the whole image apply a suitable window function to avoid the edge effects for example humming window and calculate the Fourier transform and all of a sudden we can start to have a beautiful Fourier transform of the image you can see a number of peaks some of them correspond to the lattice peaks some of them correspond to the electronic properties of the graphene so i will talk about it a little bit later and uh, then the question becomes what can you do with this information and the first thing you can do is use it in order to extract specific aspects of the materials physics for example if i take my fourier transform and i create a filter that selects only the peaks corresponding to the electronic reconstruction the dirac cones multiply my fourier transform by this filter 
Then I will get a filtered Fourier transform. So we essentially removed all the information corresponding to structure and noise and left only the information corresponding to the electronic properties. If we do the inverse Fourier transform, we start to see the pattern like this. So this is the original image, which has both electronic structure and atomic structure. And then we filtered it, and we basically see the image which represents only the standing electronic waves inside the material. Okay, great. What else can we do? Well, we of course can play with a different form of the filtering. For example, we can choose the filter that preserves only atomic structures. So we choose the filter that is centered on the lattice points, and then we can reconstruct atoms. Or we can, if we wish to do so, we can create a filter that will leave only two Fourier spots in some specified direction. And then we can create an image corresponding to this type of filtering. The problem of this analysis, however, is entirely obvious. So first of all, once we perform the global Fourier transform, that means that everything is averaged. And as you can see on this image, it actually contains a lot of regions with a slightly different structure, so almost like grains or uh, patterns or topologies. Secondly, a global Fourier transform doesn't work that well if the image contains uh, defects, multiple grains, and so on and so forth. So basically, we are averaging out all the interesting phenomena except for small spatially uniform structural distortions. The second problem is that when we use the Fourier transform to filter the data in such a way as to leave the physics of interest, this is the procedure that comes with a significant amount of the experimental bias. In some sense, we find only the physics that we are looking for. If we filter the image leaving only the certain lattice peaks, then all other structural elements, which corresponds to different periodicities, will just not be there. So it's a great way to start the image analytics, but maybe not the best way to uh, do in-depth analysis. How are we going to solve this problem? The solution can be using the sliding window approach. So in this case, we apply the, take our image, separate it in the tiles, which can be either overlapping or non-overlapping, and we perform the Fourier transform within each tile. And in this way, we convert the image in the collection of the Fourier transforms from the subset. And then within these tiles, and uh, we can uh, analyze either the Fourier transforms themselves, for example, fit Fourier peaks to find out the amplitudes and positions and map them from tile to tile, or perform the multivariate analysis of this Fourier transform. So the important note here is that the window in the sliding window approach can also be tied to a specific feature. For example, we can develop the analysis methods when we identify all the atoms inside the plane and uh, find the atoms of interest and analyze the tiles around those. So this is a great approach to study the atomic neighborhoods of specific atoms. And uh, in one of the subsequent presentation, Maxim is going to talk about the application of this approach. For the time being, let's just talk about the simple sliding window of FT. data. We take our whole Fourier transform and we treat each peak as uh, independent. Of course, after we correct for symmetry, there would be a smaller number, but still we have a lot of numbers which do not necessarily have a clear physical meaning. So the question becomes, can we do better? And uh, as you have uh, heard in the previous lectures, one of the great ways to work with the large volumes of data, which have some strong similarities, is to use the multivariate unmixing methods. So the question becomes, can we use the sliding Fourier transform approach and uh, find the multivariate statistical method that is ideally matched to the type of the problem. And uh, in this case, that would include the physics and chemistry of material and also the physics of the Fourier transform process. So what do we know? First of all, we know that once we calculate the Fourier transform and uh, determine the structure factor, we know that the Fourier amplitudes are non-negative. 
Second thing we know is that when we calculate the Fourier transform and uh, remove the phase, then our data is no longer sensitive to the translation. This is really important because once we tile the image, our tile can be in any registry with respect to the underlying lattice. So the translation is uncertain. So once we do the Fourier transform and take the amplitude, translation doesn't matter anymore. So this is great. This is what we know about the Fourier transform. So what about the material? Well, in general, we don't know much about the material, but we can speculate that uh, either we deal with the uh, chemical system when we have uh, several phases. And in this case, we expect that uh, phases do not coexist in the same point of space. So if we look at specific locations, it's either one phase or another phase. At the same time, if we deal with the physical systems, for example, with the symmetry breaking and the emergence of the other parameter fields, the different structures can actually coexist. For example, if the lattice is distorted in x direction, it can also be distorted in the y direction at the same time. So the polarization in x and polarization in y can coexist in the same location. So it turns out that uh, there is, a, in fact, a multivariate analysis method which is ideally matched to the physics of the Fourier transform. And this is so-called the n find r, where we assume that the spectrum, or in our case Fourier transform, at a given pixel, so pixel in this context would be our tile, is assumed to be a linear combination of the n members. And uh, this mixing uh, sums to the one. So we discussed the n find r and closely related Bayesian linear and mixing in the previous lecture. So here, let's see how we can use this combination of the sliding FFT and n find r to identify the phases within the image. In a little bit more detail, you can see that the way we have generated it, the atomic structures are slightly deformed here. So there is some third component which cannot be represented as the linear combination of the uh, image on the left and the image on the right. So that's great. What happens if we keep pushing? So let's say we ask the n find r to separate our data set in four components. So in this case, it turns out that the analysis start to fail. So we start to separate one of the phases into the underlying components. But this type of failure is very, diff very easy to identify. We just see it that in this case, we clearly started to over separate the data. So the nice thing is about this combination of sliding Fourier transform and then find R is that now we have a very robust algorithm that allows to separate phases based on spatial localization and geometry. And robust means that we don't need to tune this algorithm. We don't, except for the global parameters of the size of the tile and the number of components. It is basically can be run in the fully automatic fashion. So now you can find a notebook for analysis of the data using the sliding FFT on the pycroscopy domain on the GitHub. And uh, you can read more about this analysis and how it is implemented and how it works in uh, this publication. The next thing you can ask, however, is whether this approach works for the real experimental data as well as it works for synthetic data. And the answer is yes, it does. This is an example of scanning transmission electron microscopy image of the molybdenum vanadium based complex oxide. You can clearly see that there are two phases here. So the M1 is the hexagonal phase and the M2 is the some form of the more phase with the more complex structure. So the question becomes, can we take this uh, image and separate it into the proper and using it find the properties of the individual M1 and M2 phase. So let's do our sliding FFT and find R approach. So we create the window. This is its size. We slide the window across the surface. We perform the Fourier transforms, and then we apply the n find R on the stack of the Fourier transforms. And lo and behold, our first n member is uh, structureless. This is just edge effects. 
and this component is concentrated in the bottom left corner of the image. And that's great because this is exactly when there is nothing, so we identify the empty space. The second component has a beautiful Fourier transform, so very nice uh, hexagonal structure. And it turns out that this is uh, localized exactly in the place where there is a M1 phase of the material. And finally, the third component is localized within this grain, and this is M2 phase. And now you can see that uh, there is no well-defined Fourier transform. There is a clear uh, radial distribution function, but from the point of view of the Fourier transform, this material seems to be uh, amorphous. However, in this case, you can say that this analysis can be performed manually. If you spend enough time, you can contour this uh, boundary of the grain manually, and you can perform this analytics. Well, that's of course as true, but the nice thing about the automatic algorithms is that they you don't have to do it. Secondly, imagine the situation when rather than having one grain, you have multiple grains. It would be pretty difficult to do it by hand. So the advantage of the automatic methods is that they do it for you. Now, what about the case when the uh, different type of orderings can coexist? And this is the second example of application of the nfindr with the sliding Fourier transform. This time for the scanning tunneling microscopy of the ruthenium trichloride. So this is the material which has very interesting physics related to the fact that the ruthenium atoms can effectively demerize. So we have this uh, scanning tunneling microscopy image. We can look at it and even by eye we can recognize that in some places there are sort of isolated atoms and sometimes they try to form the dimers. So the question is can we analyze this image and get a better insight into this atomic structure. So again, we define our sliding window, we perform the Fourier transform, we analyze the stack of the Fourier transforms with the n find r, and we get one end member, and we get a second end member. Notice that there are Fourier peaks that are present in one, and they are completely absent in the other one, so we get something we learn something about the physics of this material. So the presence of the uh, presence or absence of the Fourier peak tells us about what is the symmetry breaking mechanism in the system. It's also illustrative to look at the abundance maps. You can see that the first one is relatively disordered. The second one, however, shows the clear domains where this component is close to one or sufficiently large, and the second domains where this component is essentially zero meaning that in these regions, the peaks are present. That's great. So we start to get some insight in the nanoscale phase separation inside this material. Can we learn what the structure of this individual component is? The answer is yes. All we have to do is to take our N members, perform the inverse Fourier transform, and it turns out that for this end member, the real space image of the phase will look like this. So this is a hexagonal super lattice. And for this end member, the super lattice will look like this. So this would be a dimer. So it looks like that we are able to take our image and uh, observe that there is a presence of the structural breaking distortions. We can localize the structure breaking distortions and even recover the associated real space phases. Again, you can read more about this work in this publication. Would this methodology work for the mesoscopic data? The answer is yes, of course. So this is a simple example of the uh, surface of the ferroelectric relaxer that have these beautiful labyrinthine domain structures. So we are, can apply the sliding Fourier transform, and uh, in this case use something like principal component analysis, and we can get the nice images of the loading maps and the eigenvectors. But in this case, the statistics is not enough to extract something other than the preferential form of the ordering inside the image. 
again. You can read more about these uh, approaches in uh, this publication and the uh, uh, slightly older paper uh, in the Applied Physics Letters. Now, what are the limitations of sliding Fourier transform? So the first limitation is that we always have a problem of how to choose the window size. So if we choose our tile too large, then we lose spatial resolution. So we, uh, they start to overlap, so we don't really learn much. At the same time, if our window size is too small, then the Fourier transform start to behave poorly because of the edge effect. So we really cannot perform the Fourier transform if we have only a few unit cells inside the tile window and expect to have a good answer. Second, the interpretation of the Fourier transform data is a little bit complicated. So if we try to fit each peak, we have too many components, even allowing for the symmetry. If we perform the unmixing using unfined or Bayesian linear unmixing, the meaning of the components is uh, not necessarily clear. So what can we do? Well, most of the time we work with atomically resolved images. So therefore, maybe we should look at slightly different descriptor, which is for atomically resolved images is atomic coordinates. So the question becomes, can we take the image like this, so this is the same STM image that you've seen before, and find all the atoms and obviously all the vacancies in this image. In principle, this type of analysis can be done manually, but if you think about the problem of manually finding information even in one image that will take hours, think about doing it on tens and hundreds and thousands of images that modern electron microscopes produce per day. So we clearly need to develop the automatic methods to convert the image data into the atomic position data. So how are we going to do it? Let me show you the example of relatively early work when we performed this analysis using the combination of the Fourier methods and the position refinement. So in this case, we start with the original data, which is just our image. We calculate the Fourier transform, so you can see beautiful primary peaks and peaks corresponding to the ordering. We filter this data to leave only the primary peaks that correspond to the primary lattice parameter, and uh, we delete everything else, and we perform the inverse Fourier transform. Once we do that, what is left is only the primary atomic lattice. So we have essentially deleted all the defects, all the short range effects, all the long range periodicities, which are corresponding to small structural distortions. And once we've done that, we can use our original image, subtract this uh, filtered image, and then we get the bright spots and the positions of the vacancies and the impurity atoms. So that's great. So now we can find both the real atoms on the image and we can also find the vacancies in the image. So this is what we get. This is our original data set and this is our ghost atoms which are localized exactly where the vacancies are. At the next step, we can uh, get our positions for defects and for atoms on the surface and refine these positions by fitting each atomic feature using Gaussian. So this is the workflow for this process. We start from the image, we find the initial positions, we fit it by the Gaussians. If some atoms are not discovered, we can repeat the process uh, and uh, at the very last step, we can actually manually add some position if some atoms are missed. Then we uh, finally refine the uh, analysis and get the atomic coordinates for each atom and each vacancy. This is how the data looks like. This is where we start. This is how the image looks like once it is filtered. This is how the image of the vacancies look like. 
And this is how the image looks like when we find the position of each atom, and now we have a, a definition of uh, where the atoms are. What are we going to do next? So we went through all this exercise of finding atoms and finding vacancies. What can we learn from this data? And the answer is that uh, first question would be, do we have any kind of physical model that will tell us what to look for? And very often this physical model would be suggested by the examination of the image. So if you look at this image very, very carefully, for example, in this part of the image, and zoom in on this part, you can see that the atomics, atomic rows here, are in fact, is not straight. They are corrugated. So they go like a zigzag. This corrugation amplitude is very, very small, but nonetheless, it's visible. Therefore, what we can do is we can define the corrugation amplitude. And this is how we do it. So we take each atom, we define four neighbors that this atom have, and then we try to see whether this atom is shifted in one direction or in the other direction. Then we further define the displacement angle. So what is the angle formed between the atom A, O, and C in the direction of a shift? So in this case, we define atoms in two groups, those shifted in the x direction, those shifted in the y direction, and we, for each directional shift, we assign the magnitude of this angle. In this direction, sorry for that, then we can see that this is the part of the image where things are ordered. The question becomes, can we represent this data in a more compact form? And the answer is yes, we can just uh, designate the atoms that are shifted in the x direction as blue, the ones that are shifted in the y direction as red, and then we plot the data as the image containing the uh, magnitude and the direction of the shift, and all of a sudden you can see that we have a blue domain over here and we have a red domain over here. So to summarize, we clearly have a visible zigzag distortion on the surface at atom sublattice. We see that there are structural domains, and uh, you can read more about what this is and uh, how we discovered them in this publication. However, we also have done one very important thing. So I can quote the statement by Freeman Dyson that there are two types of scientific revolutions, the concept-driven and tool-driven, and the effect of the concept-driven one is to explain the old things in new ways. But the effect of the tool-driven one is to discover new things that have to be explained. So what we've done here is we developed a mathematical tool that allows us to process the data and find some new phenomena, in this case, formation of the structural domains. So it's great. What can we learn else about these domains? Well, it turns out that if we image these domains under the different conditions, so one case under the positive bias, another case under the negative tip bias, you can see that in the one case we see the structural domains, and in the negative bias we don't see these domains anymore. And the reason why it happens is because when you scan the surface with the negative tip, then you attract the oxygen atom to the tip, and that leaves the structural distortion responsible for the formation of the structure. So we can quantify this behavior by making the histogram of the distortion angles. So in the one case it's bimodal, in the second case it's a unimodal. So can we compare this type of atom-based analytics to the Fourier-based analysis? The answer is yes, we can. So this is the STM image. This is our Fourier transform. So we can take this 24 uh, Fourier peaks and uh, fit each one by the Gaussian and then plot the parameters of this fit. And for example, it turns out that if we look at the magnitude of the peak number 18, so this particular peak here, you can see that it has a different magnitude here in this uh, domain region 
compared to everywhere, everywhere else. So this P18 is uh, directly responsible for the soldering. However, if you compare the Fourier transform-based analysis and distortion analysis, you can see that the representation and the quality of the data are much, much clearer in case when we go through all the exercise of atom finding and uh, image-based analytics. Now, can we generalize this type of behaviors? So here the problem becomes, uh, can we take our data sets and uh, automatically classify the phases and ferroic variants from the atomically resolved image data? For example, can we find the regions where there is one phase, where the second phase in one orientation, and second phase in the different orientation? So the input here is the atomic coordinates, where uh, we can parameterize each atom by x, y, and uh, for each lattice site. So there are two nodes here. First of all, this input is more or less easy to generate for electron microscope images without discontinuities. Uh, for STM, it tends to be more complicated, so we often have to deal with the vacancies and impurities. But I've shown you the example of how to deal with that. Second point is that uh, we need to know that there is a difference between the point group and the spatial group. And I'll show you the example when uh, we work only with the point group based on So the approach of the local crystallography is predicated on the following concept. So for each atom, we define the nearest neighbors and generate the array of the corresponding radius vectors of the form uh, Rx, Ry1. So this is the radius vector to the one neighbor, radius vector to the second neighbor, third neighbor, and so on. So these indices, 1, 2, 3, and 4, are chosen in the same sense for all the atoms. So, of course, here we have the example for the square lattice, but the generalization for other lattices and the further coordination spheres is obvious. So then the problem of identification of phases and spheroic variants is equivalent to, uh, to finding the statistically equivalent groups of nearest neighbors. So for point group, we, for limited sense, we use point groups. For general sense, we use the spatial group and also add the translation symmetry operations. So this is how we can do that. So this is one way we can take our image apply our rotation groups, and then find the phases that do not change as a function of rotation, for example, the uh, red phase, or we find the phases and orientation that transform to each other upon the rotation. That gives us the relevant subgroup, which defines this ferroic variant. So this is great. Let's look at the example. So this is uh, the uh, example of the similar image of the uh, molybdenum vanadium oxide, where we clearly see the presence of the multiple phases. So the first way we can try to explore this data is to perform the chemical analysis. In other words, to separate the image into the different phases based on the similarity of the atomic neighborhoods. So to do that, we find all the images in this uh, data set. We define the radius vector, so the chemical neighborhoods, and we perform the uh, k-means clustering of this data. So once we do that, you can cl clearly see on this dendrogram, so this is our uh, initial cluster, and then we start to separate the atoms in two groups, three groups, four groups, and so on. So we can stop our clustering at some threshold, and then the plot in different colors, the uh, indicate by different colors, the cluster to which the atoms belong. And all of a sudden, if we perform the clustering based on the lengths of the vector, we get this type of map. If we perform the clustering based on angles, then we get this type of map. But in the end, we start to get the insight on where the different atoms are positioned. And all of a sudden, you can see that there are some interesting 
structures here. For example, the M1 phase is uh, almost symmetric, so there is nothing interesting going on here. However, you can see that the blue color cluster separates their regions with some unusual ordering. So it's neither M1 phase, nor it is the M2 phase. It's some kind of mixture semi-amorphous phase. At the same time, within M2 phase, we start to see the clearly defined atomic groups of different type. So fantastic. Can we get something, some additional insight in this field? The answer is yes, we can just look at these uh, clusters one by one. So this is one type of chemical behavior. So we see where these atoms are localized. We can calculate the pair distribution function and the Fourier transform. And we can see that atoms of this type form almost amorphous cloud. This is the second type of atom. So you can see that they form the phase M1 and they also form islands inside the phase M2. This is their pair distribution function. This is the corresponding Fourier transform. So you can see that most of these atoms are sitting on the ideal hexagonal lattice. And there is also the amorphous ring, which corresponds to this part of the image. So far, so good. And these are two more clusters. So this is the cluster which is largely centered inside the phase M2. And uh, this is the cluster which seems to form the uh, phase of its own. So notice that this one, if we calculate the Fourier transform, it shows the two clear rings, so there is a preferential spacing. This one seems to be much more disordered, so there is only one ring and there's also much more broad than for other phases. So what we've done here is we took our chemical and homogeneous system and we have separated it into the uh, different types of atoms and we can even analyze the structural properties of these types of atoms. Now, the next question becomes uh, whether can we apply this type of analytics for different type of images. For example, the images which are almost perfect, at least by uh, manual examination. So this is the example of the image of the same material, but uh, the different parts and different orientation. So here you can clearly see the uh, almost ideal ordering pattern, and you really cannot see much here. So this is the example of the same analytics when we find all the atoms in the image, and then we perform the chemin clustering based on the lengths or based on the angles. And all of a sudden, you start to see that, in fact, there is actually some extra structure here. You can see that, for example, in this image, you can see the atomic rows, and then the top part of the image and the bottom part of the image, these rows are shifted. So we have an antiphase boundary, which goes like this across the material. So the clustering method allows us to visualize the identity of each atom. And uh, once we do that, we can clearly see that there is a... Uh, invisible structural element that we cannot notice on the ideal image. The next question becomes is, uh, can we learn some insight into the nature of the structural distortions that define those phases? So in this case, we take our uh, radio vector and uh, rather than doing the Kimian's clustering, which separate atoms in the groups, we actually perform the principal component analysis, which tries to find the distortions from the ideal structure and uh, uh, orders this uh, distortions in the sequence of importance. So the most important distortion is the just expansion contraction. So there is uh, just uh, strains inside the system. But the second distortion looks like the collective shifts of all the atoms in one direction. And the map here shows the magnitude of this distortion, and you can see that atoms are positioned in the alternating positive-negative rows. The third component looks like this, so it's some form of the strain pattern. And the fourth, fifth, and sixth components become progressively more complicated. What is rather remarkable is that even the high-order components show some very characteristic periodic patterns and furthermore, some of these components allow to visualize our antiphase boundary rather clearly. That's rather interesting because it seems that the antiphase boundary is associated with the suppression of specific distortion components. For example, for
for this distortion component number four, uh, it is non-zero everywhere except for the grain boundary. It almost looks like an order parameter field where the grain boundary suppresses the order parameter. So this is actually a very interesting analogy between this statistical normal modes and the classical order parameter theory, which we are still exploring. And we'll talk about it in one in the subsequent lectures. But for the time being, you're welcome to learn more about the local crystallography in this publication. This is the general collection of the publication on the atom finding, the observation of structural and electronic orders, and the phase identification. So you're welcome to look at those in more detail. Now, let's talk more a little bit of the correlation between the structure and properties. And let's look at this uh, simple example. So this is the scanning tunneling microscopy image of the high temperature superconductor where we can map the atomic structure. Then we can select this image on the surface. And within this uh, sub-image, we can perform the scanning tunneling spectroscopy. So we measure the uh, IV curves. In some locations, the IV curve is just uh, a normal tunneling curve, so we see a gap. In some regions, there is no gap, so you can see that blue curve are gapless. We can analyze this data to extract the magnitude of the superconductive gap, and then we can plot it. And you can see that along this line, which corresponds to this defect in the image, we can see that the superconductivity is largely reduced. So this is the defect which breaks superconductive properties. So what can we learn about this defect? Okay, we can take our STM image, we can filter it, and uh, we can look at the orientations of the atomic rows. So you can see that actually there is a shift here. This is a, a boundary in the material. And you can also see that the molar volume of this material along this grain boundary is reduced. And now you can look at these two images, so this local crystallographic image and the superconductive gap, and you can see that the region with the reduced superconductive behavior and the region with the reduced molar volume are roughly the same regions. So we learn something about the physics of the material. However, the next question becomes, can we do better? For example, there are multiple other structural features in the local crystallographic image. For example, we have the spot that corresponds to the reduction of the lattice parameter. At the same time, we see almost at the same location the spot where the superconductive properties are reduced. So is it possible to directly match the local atomic structure and the local superconductive properties and extract the relationship between the structure and properties directly by matching the structural and functional images. So in this case, of course, it is very difficult to do because the structural image and the functional image are not registered. So they are roughly of the same region, but there is no one-to-one -one relationship between the pixel here and pixel here. So the question is, can we develop the tools that allow us to perform this type of operation in data mining? And the answer is yes, it's possible, but in fact, uh, we can start this type of analysis even from simple structural images. And in this case, the very useful material is the graphene, because as we've seen in the beginning of this presentation, graphene has a wonderful property that if you look at the images and analyze the Fourier transform, you get to learn both the structural and the electronic information. So they correspond to the different peaks in the Fourier transform. So this is the example of the several images of the different types of graphene, the graphene with the bare vacancies, the graphene with the hydrogenated vacancies, and the graphene with the oxidized vacancies. So all these defects result in the uh, changes in the 
charge density distribution in the graphene, so we see these complex electronic patterns. So what we can do is to take our image, calculate our Fourier transform, we can identify our peaks corresponding to the structural uh, lattice and peaks corresponding to the um, electronic properties, so to the Dirac cones. And then, uh, of course, if we do it on the global image, we get the average information. However, we can use our sliding Fourier transform method, and that means that inside each sliding window, we determine both electronic properties from the position of this uh, K4, K5, K6 peaks, and we get to learn the structural properties from the position of K1, K2, and K3 peaks. So, in such a way, we can data mine this image to learn both structural and electronic information at each location. What are we going to do next? So that's still a lot of information. So one of the way to approach this data is through the exploration of the simple correlations, for example, through the Pearson correlation analysis. So we have done that. And uh, this is how this resulting output looks like. So we have the magnitudes of the Dirac Pons coordinates. So the x, y, x, y, x, y for the peak 4, peak 5, and peak 6. And this is the lattice strain. So we have the strains in the different uh, components. If we look at the correlation matrix, you can clearly see that it's not random. There is a clear correlation between the strains and the behavior of certain peaks. For example, this column corresponds to strong positive correlation, and this column corresponds to the anti-correlation. Slightly different way to explore this data is to look for the uh, canonical correlated analytics. So in this case, we take two hour of data sets and start to explore which of the combination of the linear combination of the components in first data set and second data set gives us larger correlation coefficients. So in this case, it turns out that we can find some uh, correlation between the scattering amplitudes and lattice strain. And uh, again, this may tell us something about the materials physics. So in this kind of particular case, we can speculate that uh, there is a relationship between the uh, electronic properties and the lattice strain, which is related for the formation of the out-of-plane uh, binded oxygen atoms. So you can learn about this analysis more in this publication. But then the next question becomes is, what is the relationship between our physics uh, and structure is nonlinear? So linear is only a special case. In this case, we can try to approach this problem with the kernelized canonical correlation analysis. So in the CCA, we first perform the nonlinear mapping of our data to a high dimensional space, and then we perform the CCA in this new feature space. So this, in principle, can result in the high complexity of data because we increase the dimensionality. But fortunately enough, there is a special trick called the kernel trick, which uh, can basically based on the fact that even if we go the higher dimensional space, the number of data points does not increase. So the great thing about this uh, kernel CCA is that it allows us to find out what is the physics of the problem if we manage to guess it. So think about it this way. So imagine that you are in the chemistry 601 lab and you study the kinetics of the chemical process and you have some relationship between the concentration of the material and time. If you plot this data in your program of choice, for example origin, and you happen to find out that your experimental dimension is uh, linearized in the long log plot, then you know that this is a power law. So the data becomes very simple if the, you choose the right coordinate system. So kernel CCA works in exactly the same way, except that this is a generalization for multiple uh, data sets. So this is the example. So what we do here is we 
try to find the optimal correlation between the stimulus and response by exploring the different form of the kernels. And just let's make a test example when we take a, a test data which has the quadratic relationship between the stimulus and response. And then we try to analyze this data using the polynomial kernel, using the linear kernel, using the periodic kernel. And you can see that if we have the quadratic data and we have a, a linear relationship, then in this case our canonical correlation is zero. So if the points are distributed on the circle, the linear relationship between them shows that they are not correlated. So that's the difference between the correlation and causation. So they are related to each other, but linear correlation is zero. If we use the second order polynomial, then our correlation becomes one. So we found the physics that we were looking for. And if we use the third and high order polynomial kernels, then the relationship doesn't improve because we have already found the relevant physics uh, at the second degree order. At the same time, if we use the uh, exponential or sinusoidal uh, kernels, then our correlation is clearly very low. So our the parabola exponent and sine are very different functions and you see that sine works particularly bad. Okay, this is the behavior for test data. This is how we apply it for the experimental data. So it looks like that using the high order polynomials improve our canonical correlation, and in fact, brings us up to one. So we argue that this indicates that there is a nonlinear relationship between the strain and density of states. And basically we get an approximation of this relationship out of the data. That said, uh, the use of the kernel ICC really requires a very good idea of what the physics is. So what about other examples? What else can we do? So this is a second example of the uh, analysis of the STM data when we have atomic positions and uh, spectroscopic data sets where we try to explore the structure property relation by mapping one to another directly. And in this case, we have a data set with the several well-defined defects. We can show that on the clean region, we have a perfect uh, tunneling curve with a clearly defined, clearly visible um, superconductive gap. Over the defect, we have a slightly different behavior. So our band gap is broader, but our superconductive feature is not as well developed. So what we can do is to take the data set and use our favorite uh, n find r in order to separate this data into the n members and corresponding loading maps. And this is what we get. So this is our loading map. You can clearly see that for a component which has a well-defined uh, superconductive behavior is localized in the ideal material, the component that has a uh, no superconductive gap but has a band gap is concentrated on defects and there is some additional component which has a relatively low intensity which seems to be concentrated inside the material. So in this case what we can do is the next step since our data is very high quality we can try to do the direct data mining of structural and the electronic data. So what we do here is we define our atomic lattice sort of, of on the atomic level we define the structural descriptors, for example, AB ratio, unit cell area, and the angle angles. Then we take our spatial maps for the tunneling spectra, and we do the registration between the imaging and the tunneling data. So we get the special maps of the first and member, second and member, and the third and member, but in this case, we have this lattice ideally registered with the uh, structural data set. So in this case, we have the structural information and the electronic properties from the same like. Then we can start to explore the structure property correlation analysis. So for example, we can start with the standard Pearson correlation and construct the Pearson correlation matrix between the structural parameters, T1, 
tetragonality, angle and area, and the end members, first, second and third of the electronic properties. You can see that this part of the diagram shows the correlation between the structural behaviors. And you can see that the higher angle corresponds to the higher AB ratio, but uh, there is not that much correlation between the area and the angle. So in some sense, strains and the molar volumes are uncorrelated. At the same time, if we look at the correlations within the electronic properties, there is a very strong anti-correlation between the end member two and end member three. And that makes a lot of sense because one of them actually says that there is a superconductive behavior and the other one says that there is no superconductive behavior. So we expect that to happen. Now, the interesting part here is this part of the diagram that explores the correlation between the structural behavior and the end members. And interestingly enough, in this case, correlations are relatively weak, which basically tells us that it is the presence of the impurity atoms rather than structure that suppresses the superconductivity. Now, slightly different way to analyze these data sets is to look at the spatial correlation between the variables using the bivariate Morin's analysis, which allows for analysis of the neighborhood interactions. So if we do that, we start to get the Morin maps for the different end members and uh, once we go through this analytics, we can see that the presence of the defects, which are large distortion of the structure maps, correlates with the suppression of the superconductive gap in the nearby regions. And uh, again, you can learn more about it in uh, this publication. So this is the summary of the publication on this topic. So you can learn about the analysis and data mining of the graphene and the superconductive materials in these publications. Shape like this, so it's a ball, and the ball can be oriented up or down on the sample surface. In addition, this molecule can have several rotation states, so it can be rotated at different angles within respect to the lattice. Therefore, the STM image of the self-assembled molecules will encode the information both on the orientation uh, up and down and the orientation in plane. It turns out that this can be an interesting model system for the physics of the systems with the multiple order parameter, when one of the parameter is the up-down state and another order parameter is the rotation state. The question becomes, can we take this data, extract it from the STM image, and then use it to build a statistical model of this system? So in order to do that, we need to start with finding all the molecules in this image and figuring out what the orientation states are. And if you look at this image, you can see that by eye that they all pretty much look all the same. So it's clearly not something that we can do manually. So the question becomes, can we improve our data analytics beyond the simple Fourier-based and atom-finding methods? And the answer is yes, we can. So first thing we can do is we can come collect all the information we know about the system. And it turns out that we have some information about the possible structures, so we call it a physical prior, and we have some information about the density of states. Then we can use this information to enhance our molecular identification using two techniques. One is the mark of random field models. It turns out that it is ideally applicable for the analysis of the molecular state up and down. And second is the deep learning, which allows us to identify very well the rotational classes of the molecule. So the combination, the workflow based on this mark of random field and the deep learning allows us to fully decode the molecular states on this image and uh, essentially classify them as up and down and uh, how they're rotated. And uh, then it turns out that we can data mine this information. For example, we can find the correlations in this data set and find out the correlations are actually pretty weak. Secondly, we can try to analyze the inversion of the process so we can get some insight into the process of inversion from up and down state. And again, you can read about more about it in uh, this publication. This is MPJ Computational Materials in 2007.
Finally, let me say that uh, present, this presentation provides some historical methods for analysis of the image data. So if you want to learn more about the application of the machine learning in electron microscopy rather than SPM, or more advanced methods for image identification using deep learning, stay tuned.